Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining tonight. Uh, welcome to the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. Uh, my name is James Robinson. I'm an assisting at, uh, assistant attending physician in uh, primary sports medicine and hospital for special surgery in New York, New York. Um, and so um, as we kind of go through always with our first uh, things, the National Fellow Online Lecture Series is sponsored by the AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee in coordination with the AMSSM Education Committee and AMSSM Fellowship Committee. Um, this is meant to serve as an adjunct to your individual programs education programming, um, and it's to provide fellows with direct access to educational experience with experienced AMSSM members, and at times invited guest speakers in a variety of formats. Um, and it's to assist in CAQ exam preparation, which is gonna be the main focus of tonight's lecture. Um, so if you would mute your devices and make sure your microphones are turned off. If you could turn off your video, just optimize um, uh, internet function. Um, if you have questions, which I hope there will be questions um, to this, submit them through the chat. Um, we are gonna use a different kind of format tonight because this is gonna be kind of a question and answer session. So we're gonna go through some CAQ prep uh, questions and there will be a poll so you can kind of enter your answers in. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about the correct answer, you know, why that's the correct answer um, and kind of go into some details about the individual topics. So hopefully this will be a good way to kind of get you introduced into some of the type of questions that may be on your CAQ exam. So. Message screens here. So we'll just go ahead and dive right in uh, to the first uh, question, but we're gonna um, just kind of a little bit about the CAQ exam for those of you who have or aren't studied this. So typically the CAQ exam is gonna be two sections, 100 questions each, you have two hours to complete the 100 questions. Um, and then there's an optional 15 break, uh, minute break in between. If you're not already familiar with these resources, I highly recommend that you get them and study them. Um, these are pr probably the two best resources for studying for the CAQ. So the AMSSM Sports Medicine CAQ Study Guide is a question and answer book. Um, and that's where our questions tonight are gonna come from. Um, and then the Sports Medicine Study and Review Board, uh, Study Guide and Review for the Boards is more of a text format talking about the different topics that are commonly on the CAQ exam. Okay. So uh, first question. So. You are the physician at the finish line of a large marathon when a 44-year-old female runner collapses 100 meters before the finish line. The athlete is confused. She's sweating profusely and cannot walk. A rectal temperature is obtained, revealing a temperature of 103 degrees Fahrenheit or 39.4 degrees uh, Celsius. What is the following method of active treatment? A, help the athlete walk it off. B, continuous spraying of cool water. C, applying ice to the neck, axilla, and groin, or D, ice water immersion. Um, so Andy, I don't actually know how to bring up the poll results. Um, oh, there you go, okay. So um, the vast majority of people said ice water um, immersion with a few people um, uh, selecting applying ice to the head, uh, to the neck, axilla and groin. So the correct answer is D, ice water immersion. So this athlete has heat stroke. So even though her temperature is less than 40 degrees Celsius, so that is the common um, way to diagnose heat stroke is a temperature over 40 degrees Celsius, but she has signs of in or organ damage. So she has mental confusion, which is a sign of in organ damage, and that qualifies her as having heat stroke versus having heat exhaustion. For heat stroke, the treatment is rapid cooling. And so the mantra is always cool first, transport second. Um, so ice water immersion is the preferred cooling uh, method. It cools at point, uh, 0 0.14 degrees Celsius to 0 0.17 degrees Celsius. So it is the most effective cooling mechanism. Um, whereas ice to the neck, axilla and groin only cools at about 15 uh, degrees Fahrenheit per hour. So it's much, uh, much a much slower way to cool. If that's all you have available, of course, that's what you use. But 
you know, when you're taking a test, it's always going to be the most correct answer, which the most correct answer is here is ice water immersion. Um, and then typically you're going to want to cool till about 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's when you would transport uh, to, to your tertiary care center. You do want to avoid cooling too um, far below that because you can get rebound hypothermia. And so um, that, that the suggestion is kind of to keep them in the tub until it's about 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously, a rectal temperature is the preferred method as oral temperatures are not reliable, especially in someone in heat stroke. And certainly like your temporal and your skin thermometers are just not as reliable, especially with heat stroke. So does anyone have any questions about that before we move on to the next question? Okay. So question number two, a 32 year old male soccer player suffered a contusion to his left lower leg against a goal post while playing. He developed swelling and tenderness over his left tibia. He is taken to the emergency room after the game finished. X-rays showed a non-displaced tibial shaft fracture. He's immobilized with a cast and sent home. Five hours later, he comes back to the hospital complaining of terrible pain that has worsening and not responding to prescribed narcotics. On arrival, he starts complaining of tingling in his left lower extremity that he did not have when he came to the ER before. He has normal sensation and normal peripheral pulses of the lower extremity. He's given IV narcotics, but the pain is not going away. What is the next, uh, uh, what is the most appropriate next step in management of this case? A, admit him to the hospital for observation, keep his leg in the cast with constant elevation and consult orthopedics the next day. B, remove the cast and place him in a splint and said, discharge him from the hospital and tell him to keep ice and elevation at all times when resting and to follow up with orthopedics as an outpatient. C, consult neurology on call immediately, or D, remove the cast and immediately consult foot and ankle orthopedist on call. Okay, so um, again, the majority of people chose D here, uh, remove the cast immediately, consult the foot and ankle orthopedist on call. Um, a few for B, remove the cast, place them in a splint and discharge from the hospital. And then C, a, a few more for C, consult the neurologist on call um, immediately. So the correct answer is D, it's remove the cast and immediately consult orthopedics. Um, so obviously what the question is getting at is this patient has acute compartment syndrome. So um, the treatment for that is to Im immediately remove um, any kind of constricting external factors, but the ultimate treatment for it is an emergency fasciotomy. And so that's why it's consult orthopedics immediately. And that's why the, um, that's why that is the correct answer. Um, other correct answers you could have had were to check a pul uh, you know, a, a pressure or things like that, but those weren't options. So this was the best option out of what was given. Again, also doesn't necessarily have to be foot and ankle orthopedics. There are many orthopedists that can do an emergency patsyotomy, but again, it's choosing the best answer of what you have available. Now, the this kind of question format is going to be very common on the CIQ, where it's kind of a two-part step where you have to, where the question is leading you down the road to say acute compartment syndrome, but that's not the, you know, that's not the end. You have to know that you're thinking compartment syndrome and then you have to know how to treatment treat it. And that's the way a lot of the questions on the CAQ are gonna be. There are gonna be some just direct questions, but a lot of the clinical scenarios are gonna want you to think through things a little bit. So acute compartment syndrome occurs when pressures in the fascial compartments exceed the arterial pressures, leading to impaired tissue perfusion. Um, it most commonly occurs in the lower leg and the forearm. Um, and the symptoms are the six Ps, pain out of proportion to injury, pallor, pulsus, paralysis, peak lithermia or coldness, and paresthesia. Unfortunately, so the big thing is numbness and pulsus are, always, are almost always late findings. And so you just because you have pulses does not mean you can't have acute compartment syndrome. Just because you don't have numbness does not mean you can't don't have acute compartment syndrome. So don't let that um, fool you. Um, compartment pressure testing can confirm the diagnosis, but really treatment should not be delayed for the diagnosis. 
Um, obviously, in this case, this fracture, the fracture of the tibial shaft is a high risk fracture for bleeding and a, and a common one that you should already in a patient with a tibial shaft fracture should be thinking about acute compartment syndrome. This is probably somebody that you want to have very close follow up with. You don't want to just discharge. Also, typically for acute fractures and acute injuries, you're going to use a splint or a bivalve cast, something that has the ability to expand a little bit in the first 24 to 48 hours because the, um, uh, because the, um, the, the fracture is going to swell over that time. Okay. And so the cast is um, leading to decreased ability for the swelling to occur. Then you've already got the tight compartments and that's going to lead to decreased confusion because the bleeding has nowhere to go. So does anyone have any questions about this case? The other thing I will say about this case. So if we go back to the original question. So in the in the original question, the example, this has x-ray findings. I couldn't find the exact x-rays, so I didn't put them up, but this had this actually showed the picture of the x-rays. It's completely useless to the question. That it doesn't matter what the x-rays look like. That has nothing to do with the, the actual quest question. So those are things that are distractors. And so by you know taking time to look at the x-rays and things like that, you're just wasting time because it's not actually going to help you answer the question in any way because the original x-rays have nothing to do with the question. The question is about compute com acute compartment syndrome. So those are kind of some of the things that you may see that are kind of distractors and, and just kind of focus in on what the question's actually asking. Okay, well, we'll go on to question number three. So commotio cordis is the term used to describe ventricular fibrillation triggered by a chest wall impact, most commonly over what structure? A, the right atrium, B, the right ventricle, C, the left atrium, or D, the left ventricle. Okay, so this one is a little bit more um, varied. So still the majority chose D, the left ventricle. Um, about a quarter chose B, the right ventricle, a little less right atrium, and C, the left atrium. So the answer is D, the left ventricle. Um, so ventricular uh, fibrillation occurs following blunt problem problem of uh, trauma to the chest wall predominantly over the left ventricle. Um, it's most likely with objects reaching speeds of 30 to 50 miles per hour. And it occurs around, around 15 to 30 milliseconds prior to the peak T wave. That's kind of like the, the golden window um, of commotio cordis to occur. Because commotio cordis is a ventricular fibrillation, defibrillation is key to survival. And so an AED is critical. If defibrillation is delayed more than three minutes, the chance of survival is less than 3%. So this is something you have to recognize quickly and get the AED on, provide a shock. And in most cases, if the shock is applied in a very timely manner, then you have a good chance of survival. Any questions about this one? And don't be shy to ask questions. I may, I mean, I'm not an expert on that CAQ, so I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll let you know that I don't know the answer. And I'll try to get back to you at some point with the correct answer. Okay, well, we'll go on to um, question number four. So during a pre-participation physical exam, an athlete has 20-20 vision in his left eye, but 20-80 vision in his right eye. When is an athlete considered functionally monocular? A, when the best corrective vision in one eye is less than 2040. B, when the best uncorrected vision in one eye is less than 2040. C, when the best corrective vision in one eye is less than 2080. 
or D, when the best uncorrected vision in one eye is less than 20, 100? Okay, so um, again, a little bit varied here. Um, so the most common answers were A and C um, with less so B and D. The actual correct answer is A, when the best corrected vision in one eye is less than 2040. Um, so with, with monocular vision, you always go by um, the best corrected vision. So you're always going by corrected vision. Um, and 2040 is considered to be functionally monocular. So in an athlete that you find on a pre-participation physical to be mo uh, monocular, you would uh, wanna use mandatory eye protection as recommended for athletes and participation in sports. Um, and in sports where eye protection can't be used such as combat sports like boxing and martial arts, you should probably recommend that the athlete not participate in those sports. Again, um, as we know, up to 90% of eye injuries are preventable with proper eye protection, and some sports require them for all athletes because of that. Um, other things that may be on your CAQ when it comes to ocular injuries, um, so athletes with a history of myopia, um, history of retinal detachment, uh, history of uh, infection, or a history of eye surgery are at higher risk for eye injury. So, those are other questions that kind of may be asked. So does anyone have any questions about this one? Okay. So question number five, a 15 year old tennis player presents to your office with an injury that has been present for two months. After an examining him, you diagnose him with an overuse injury. He tells you that he's played tennis year round for the last five years and trains in an elite a tennis academy. You recall that you treated him successfully for a similar overuse injury about a year ago. On chart review, you note that he has grown three inches in the last six months. What of the following is true in regards to his risk for overuse injuries? Sports specialization at a young age has been shown to decrease injuries. B, resistance training leads to increased injuries in pediatric populations. C, a history of prior injury is an established risk factor for overuse injuries. And D, injuries rarely occur during adolescent growth. Okay, so great, everybody, the vast majority of people got this one. Um, so that is correct, a history of prior injuries and established risk factor for overuse injuries. Um, so um, prior, um, there's multiple studies that show that prior injury is a well-established risk factor for overuse injuries. Obviously A is wrong because we know early sports specialization has actually been shown to increase the risk of overuse injuries and increase the risk of burnout. Um, resistance training under proper su supervision has been shown to be safe in pediatric populations. And D is wrong because during periods of rapid growth, in injuries are increased. So does anyone have any questions about this question? There are a couple of questions in the chat box. So um, uh, one of the questions from Dr. Henney was, do you expect there to be any questions on COVID related uh, to athletes long COVID or any cardiac or medical protocols pertaining COVID? I would anticipate not. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. One, these questions are vetted and, and done well in advance. And so um, 
I, you know, I don't think that there would be a whole lot of COVID questions. Also, the COVID environment is rapidly changing as we learn more. And so it would be very difficult to keep up with correct um, questions. I mean, obviously anything is fair game um, on the CAQ, but I would, I would not anticipate there to be a lot of COVID related questions on the CAQ. Um, somebody asked, curious what to do about an athlete whose best corrected vision is 2050 in both eyes. Uh, <laughs> I guess that 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 is an interesting question. So so the the thought behind eye protection for somebody whose best corrected vision in um, one eye is is less than twenty forty is that you want to protect the good eye because if they get damage to that eye, then they have permanent vision disability. So in somebody that already has bi, you know bilateral vision disability, I mean certainly I'd still recommend eye protection, but I don't think that it's necessarily as big of a deal. But you also have to wonder how safe, what sport are they participating in and how safe it is it to actually participate in their sport um, if they have if they only can correct their vision to 2050. So I think that that also has to come in to uh, um, can uh, come into play. Okay. So we're going to move on to question number six. So a 17 year old male comes to your office complaining of severe left lower quadrant pain that appeared six hours ago, which he believes is a result of strenuous physical activity before the symptoms started. Pain is described as achy and constant and associated with nausea and vomiting. He denies any other associated signs or symptoms in any positive medical family or surgical history. Vitals are within normal limits. On abdominal exam, you find that he has normal bowel sounds, Abdomen is soft, non-tender, and there is no rebound. All special tests for intra-abdominal and abdominal wall conditions are negative two. What is your next step? A, prescribe him a 10-day course of ciprofloxacin and metronidazole follow-up in one week. B, prescribe oral tramadol for pain and promethazine PRN for nausea with follow-up in two days. C, order a STAT, CBC, CMP, UA, and CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. D, perform a testicular exam. So um, D, performance testicular, testicular exam, 88%, um, 10%, we're gonna order labs and tests, um, and uh, two, we're just gonna treat. So what this um, question is trying to get at is that this patient doesn't actually have intra-abdominal pathology, um, but with the normal abdominal exam, um, they're trying to uh, get at that. Um, and so the, question, the answer is perform a testicular exam as what they're trying to get at is this patient has symptoms of testicular torsion. So testicular torsion is classically abrupt onset of severe testicular scrotal pain, but you don't actually have to have testicular scrotal pain. Sometimes it can present as lower abdominal pain, abdominal pain or even inguinal pain. 90% um, have nausea and vomiting. Um, on exam, you also often will find swollen, firm, tender testicles, the testicle is often high, high riding, and you also have often have loss of the cremasteric reflex. Um, so in a patient with possible torsion, treatment should not be delayed to perform imaging, even though ultrasound is one of the imaging modalities, you should never delay treatment to perform the ultrasound. And even if the ultrasound is negative, if the clinical suspicion is high for testicular torsion, they should still undergo surgical treatment. Uh, because the risk of the surgical treatment is actually much less than missing testicular torsion. So significant ischemic changes can occur um, in a, eight to, a four to eight hour window. So definitely this is something that you wanna jump on fairly quickly. Um, lateral, most testicular torsions occur medially. That may be another question that you get on the um, CAQ. So lateral rotation can be attempted while awaiting surgical referral, but it is no way of replacement for surgical referral. So questions about this. So again, this is kind of like going back to your regular kind of test taking skills. So, you know, th they're not trying to trick you what they're, you know, they're, they're leading you down a path of, you know, the abdominal exam is normal, 
He has normal bounce sounds. His abdomen's soft. He's non-tender. There's no rebound. Vitals are within normal limits. They're all, all that's trying to say, this is not a patient with an acute abdomen. So, you know, that's why, you know, ordering a CT scan, CMP, CBC in your A would be probably of, of little value. Now, we all know what happens in regular practice is, you know, all these tests get, you know, when you're in the emergency department, all these tests get ordered before you ever even see the patient. But this is not what this is not the test is asking for the best answer, the best clinical answer supported by evidence, not necessarily what's actually done in your clinical practice. Okay. Any other questions about that? Okay. So question number seven, a 25 year old male presents to the emergency department with blunt ocular trauma after he was struck in the face with a baseball. Which of the following exam findings is associated with, sorry, with an ophthalmologic emergency requiring the most immediate attention? A, restricted up gaze, B, proptosis, C, hyphema, or D, constricted pupil? Okay, this one was a pretty uh, across the board. So yeah, this is a pretty tough question in my opinion um, because I think there are multiple answers that are correct. And so in the, you're actually trying to pick the most correct answer. So um, the question actually asks you um, which one is requiring the most immediate attention. Okay, so, um, so basically with restricted gaze, what they're getting to is a blowout fracture with incarceration of the inferior rectus muscle. With proptosis, that is a sign of uh, uh, retro, um, sorry, of uh, retrobulbar hemorrhage, which is what the correct answer is. Um, with hyphema or constricted, constricted pupil is a sign of traumatic iritis. So that you have to kind of know, again, it's a double part question. You have to know what each of those represent as a disease, and then you have to pick the disease, which is the most uh, pressing. So retrobulbar hemorrhage is the most pressing because it can cause compartment syndrome of the orbit. So it can rapidly compromise vision from injury to the optic nerve and the central retinal artery. It usually presents with proptosis, limited extraocular movement, and a relative afferent pupillary defect. Emergent ophthalmology consultation and surgical decompression may be necessary to prevent vision loss. So restricted upward gaze is a scene with an orbital blowout fracture with the inferior, inferior rectus entrapment. Treatment is urgent, but not emergent. So you definitely want to get it this fix. And, and that's why I would say this is also kind of a correct answer, just maybe not the best correct answer. Um, hyphema and traumatic arteritis um, also warrant prop ophthalmologic evaluation, but they are not associated with rapid vision loss. And so, um, again, not like both could, you know, definitely you're not going to wait on these. You want to refer them out, but um, not necessarily um, associated with an emergent condition. So questions about that. Okay. Question eight, you serve as a college team physician. While you do not receive any financial compensation for this position, you serve a formal role with regard to game coverage, return to play decisions. Which of the following statement best reflects how you manage this position? A, due to competing pressures of other, for other parties, this will alter how you counsel an athlete since care is managed differently than typical patients in the community. B, despite not receiving financial compensation from the team, Good Samaritan laws do not provide protection for malpractice litigation. C, since return to play decisions affect both the athlete and the team, the usual principles of informed consent and patient autonomy do not apply. D, this position should be used as a significant part of your ma marketing practice. Thank you. 
Okay, good. So the majority of people got this one. So um, it is B. Um, because you are an official in an official position, Good Samaritan laws don't don't apply, even if you are not financially uh, reimbursed. Um, so there will be quite a few. There may be questions about your role as a team physician. There may be questions about ethics. All of those things are are part of the um, panel for CAQ questions. So for this one, while you're serving in any form of position as a team physician, you're still held to the same standards as other practicing physicians. Informed consent and decisions for Ashley are also held to the same standards as they would for um, any other practicing physician or any other patient in your practice. And according to the AAOS Code of Ethics, they state physicians should not advertise based on unmerited marks of quality, such as appointment as a team physician. Um, so, you know, in our practices, you know, you may have different laws when it comes to patient confidentiality. And when you, when you first get to your job or you're working with a team, you really need to know what those are. In most settings, especially like codless settings and things like that, athletes will have signed a like kind of disclosure HIPAA agreement saying that you can talk to coaches and, ath and athletic trainers and things like that about their medical problems as long as it's warranted and it's going to affect them. So, um, so that is the only kind of thing that's different for a team physician versus like a regular physician is some of the privacy laws. But again, those need, you need to find those out because if they're not explicitly stated or the athlete doesn't waive them, then they're under the same regulations as any other patient in your practice. So now, obviously we all know that, um, other things kind of do come into play, but ultimately it's still a role of autonomy and an informed decision and consent with the athlete. So you have to give them the risk and benefits and you have to come to a consensus with the athlete. Okay, so question number nine, when evaluating the cardio, cardiovascular risk of certain sports, the sports medicine physician must consider both uh, static and dynamic demands of the sport. What is an example of a sport with both high static and high dynamic mans, demands? A, rowing, B, long distance running, C, sprinting, D, baseball, E, American football. Um, so while we're waiting on that question, Dr. Henney asked um, about what other clinical pearls are relevant to the team physician, and he asked specifically about uh, swimming events and exact specifics. Um, I have not seen those kind of questions on the CAQ about specifics of covering specific sports. Usually, they're kind of more general about your role as the team physician, ethical considerations. Um, I mean, I guess that stuff would be fair game. I've just never seen it on a CAQ or on the CAQ prep questions. Um, so um, the answer here is rowing, um, which the majority of people got. Um, next is American football. Um, so um, static exercise involves de development of lo large intramuscular force with little to no change in muscle length or joint movements. Dynamic exercise involves change in the muscle length and joint movements with a relatively small intramuscular force. And so for rowing, the initial phase of pulling back is a static while the lengthening out phase is a dynamic. That's why it's high static and high dynamic. Obviously, long distance running is going to be the, the high dynamic, low static variety. Um, sprinting and football are actually considered moderate static and moderate dynamic. Again, I think that's a little bit tough question because American football, it's all, it's a lot of it's going to depend on the position that you play um, and different positions are going to have different demands. Um, but in general, that's the different, uh, the thought. And then baseball is considered a moderate dynamic, low static sport. Okay. Any questions about that one? Okay. Um, according to the NCA drug testing program, every division one athlete will be drug tested for performance enhancing substances at least once each academic year. 
if an athlete tests positive for a banned substance without a previous offense, what is the penalty? A, ineligibility for athletic competition for the remainder of the competitive season, including postseason. B, ineligibility from athletic competition for the remainder of the academic year. C, ineligibility from athletic competition for one calendar year from the date of notification. Or D, ineligibility for athletic competition for the remainder of their NCAA athletic career. Okay, so um, so actually the majority of people chose A. Um, the correct answer is C. So it is an ineligibility for athletic competition for one calendar year from the date of notification. Um, so for the first offense, it's one calendar year. For the second offense, they are eligible for the remainder of their NCAA athletic career. Um, so some other things that come across with drug testing, it is the responsibility of the athlete to know the banned list and they are responsible for anything they're taking. So the, the I didn't know or I didn't realize that that was in that, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work with NCAA. Um, also, they may ask you about testing procedures. So for testing procedures for the NCAA, athletes are notified in writing by a courier, and they must remain in visual contact with the courier and report for testing within one hour. They get to choose the sample, like, so they'll be um, sealed. They get to choose which one they want. Um, and then that um, they'll be, half the sample will be sent off to one lab. Half the sample will be sent off to another lab. The A will be run. If A is positive, then the B will be run for confirmation. So that's the generalized testing procedure. Anyone have any questions about that? Obviously other things that could come up, there may ask you specifically about banned substances um, on WADA's list. So making sure you're familiar with those, um, making for sure you're familiar with which sports there are, because there are certain sports where other things are banned, but legal in some sport. There are also some things that are banned during competition, but not banned during off season. So kind of knowing those kind of ins and outs um, is also something that comes up on the CAQ. Okay. So question number 11, a patient presents with chronic forearm pain that she describes as a deep ache associated with some weakness, but no loss of sensation. The pain is worse at night and she points to an error distal to the lateral epicondyle. On physical exam, she has normal sensation, but the pain is reproduced with finger extension and wrist extension. You suspect a compressive neuropathy which of the following anatomical structures is most likely the source? A, the arcade of Froch, B, the arcade of Struthers, C, Guyon's Canal, D, two heads of pronator teres. Okay, so the majority of people chose A. Um, there were um, some mix in of the others. The correct answer is A, the arcade of Froch. So this patient has posterior interosseous nerve syndrome, which is commonly compressed at the arcade of Froch. Um, it's common in athletes with repeated uh, repetitive supination and pronation. It's classically described as painless weakness of wrist and finger extensors without sensory impairment. Um, nerve conduction studies are af often abnormal with this one, um, and treatment can be non-operative but may require surgery. Um, the arcade of Struthers is ulnar nerve compression above the elbow. Guyon's canal is ulnar nerve compression at the ulnar tunnel. And the two heads of the pronary teres is compression of the medial nerve in anterior interosseous syndrome. 
So any questions about that? Okay. Question 12, which of the following is a physiologic adaptation of ascent to high altitude? A, decrease in cardiac output, B, an increase in pulmonary arterial pressure, C, worsening ventilation perfusion matching, and D, a decrease in alveolar ventilation. Okay, so the majority of people chose a, um, B or C. Um, so the answer is B. Um, again, I think this is a pretty tough question, um, but exercise physiology is a common thing that shows up on the CAQ test. Um, and it's something that I would highly recommend you review because it's not something that we get a lot in our everyday clinical practice. So the, one of the things that I think makes this question a little tough is it, um, so there are different physiologic adaptations to ascent at high altitude. So when you're talking about like acute altitude sickness, or when you're talking about training at high altitude, those are different and they have different physiological changes. And so if you kind of misread that question as training as altitude, then that's going to give you the wrong answer because some of those do um, commonly present, uh, you know, are a little different with altitude training. Um, but when you ascend to high altitudes, you do get increased pulmonary hypertension because of vasoconstriction in response to hypoxemia and increased sympathetic activity, which increases. So the increased sympathetic activity increases your blood flow and gas exchange actually improving ventilation perfusion matching because you're getting more blood flow. But this is also what may lead to hate. Um, and it's often worsened by cold and exercise. Cardiac output transient increases transiently also due to sympathetic activity. So that's why A is wrong. So questions about that. So again, these are things like the, the these kind of questions will definitely show up on the test um, almost always. So definitely something you wanna review. Uh, question 13, your patient is a 32 year old professional baseball player. He is African-American and has failed conservative treatment, uh, I'm sorry, conservative management for uncomplicated hypertension. His blood pressure is 145 over 98. What is the most appropriate first line drug choice? A, amylodipine, B, valsartan, C, enalapril, D, hydrochlorothiazide. Okay, so we're kind of, the majority of people chose amylodipine, but a little mixture of the other ones. The correct answer is amylodipine. So valsartan and is an ARB, an allopurylinase inhibitor. They, they would be good choices in Caucasian athletes, but we know from studies that um, ARBs and ACEs are less effective in African-Americans. Um, and HCTZ is a diuretic, which is banned by WADA. So you're not going to want to put your professional baseball player on that because it will may cause him to fail a drug test. So that's why amylodipine is the best answer there. Questions about that one? Okay. Um, question 14, which is true regarding vascular supply of the knee? A, with knee dislocation, the main concern is the possibility of injury to the medial uh, middle geniculate artery. 
Uh, B, the main blood supply to the ACL is from the superior medial genicular artery. C, regarding OCD in the knee, the medial femoral condyle is more often involved compared to the lateral femoral condyle due to its relatively poor blood supply. Or D, regarding OCD in the knee, the lateral femoral condyle is more often involved compared to the medial femoral condyle due to its relatively low, poor blood supply. So while we're waiting on those answers, someone did ask, do you think the sports medicine review book covers exercise physiology well enough for the CAQ? I do. I think that it's a, a great study guide um, and high yield uh, for those kind of questions. So good. I, this is one of the things I wanted to see. So the vast, uh, vast majority of people either chose C or D. So when you're taking a test and you have two opposing answers that are the exact opposite, probably more than likely one of them is true. So you could, in this question, pretty much disregard A and B and then just choose down to C or D. Um, and the correct answer is C. So the medial femoral condyle is more often involved um, due to its relatively uh, poor blood supply. So blood supply to the medial femoral condyle is from a branch of the superior medial uh, genicular artery and it has a relative watershed area. That's what makes it more prone. The lateral femoral condyle receives blood from both the superior and inferior lateral genicular artery, so it has a better blood supply. Knee dislocations have a potential to injure the popliteal artery, and the main blood supply to the ACL occurs via the middle genicular artery. Questions about that? Question 15, which of the following statements is true with respect to type one diabetic adults exercising ex with exercise sessions greater than one hour? A, insulin increases are recommended prior to the initiation of exercise. B, capillary glucose monitoring is only helpful in athletes who are using insulin pumps. C, glucagon is re the recommended choice to reverse exercise induced mild hypoglycemia that may occur with exercise. D, Late onset hypoglycemia relative to prior exercise can be prevented by increasing carbohydrate intake and lowering longer acting insulin doses. We're going to try to speed up a little bit because we're running short on time. We do have five more questions left. So we've got 20 questions total. So if you could get your answers in uh, a little quicker, we're going to kind of try to speed up a little bit with these. So good. The most majority of people got this right. The answer is D. Late onset hypoglycemia relative to prior exercise can be prevented by increasing carbohydrates and lower long acting insulin. So obviously insulin decreases, not increases are recommended prior to endurance exercise. Capillary glucose monitoring is useful in all diabetic athletes. And the recommendation is that glucose should be checked every 30 minutes of exercise. For mild hypoglycemia, oral sources of carbohydrates are preferred. Glucagon is reserved for severe hypoglycemia. Okay, questions about that. Question 16, a 19 year old division male collegiate wrestler presents you with a complaint of a painful rash on the right upper arm for the last day. Upon further inspection, it appears to look like a cluster of vesicles with an erythematous base. You decide to withhold him from practice and treat the lesion. When can he resume participation in wrestling? A, he can return to play as long as the lesions are covered with a non-permeable dressing and stretch tape. B, after the lesion is treated with a topical steroid cream and has not developed any new lesions for the last 48 hours. C, he has not developed any new lesions for the last 72 hours and all lesions have a firm crust and he's been on antiviral therapy for 120 hours. D, he has no new lesions for 48 hours before the meet and has completed 72 hours of antibiotic therapy and has no moisture draining lesions prior to competition. Or E, the lesion has been treated with both topical therapy for 72 hours 
and a minimum two week of oral therapy and all lesions are adequately covered. Okay, great. Everybody, uh, most people got this one. Um, this is C. So what we're talking about here is herpes gladiatorium, which is caused by herpes simplex one virus. So it's always going to be the classical group of vesicles on an erythematous face. Usually, almost always on, on board review questions, pre questions, they're going to give you the classic presentation of rashes. So, you know, dew drops on a rose petal, things like that. You, you just remember those, those, those phrases. Um, it's typically located on the head, neck, and upper extremities and trunks. Um, burning prior to the lesion as parents can occur. And um, it often recurs at the primary site. So usually if it recurs, it will occurs at the same site that they had it the first time. Treatment initial is valciclovir, one gram POBID for 10 to 14 days. For current episode, it's valciclovir, one gram POBID for five to seven days. And for prophylaxis, it's recommended valciclovir 500 PO daily if their last lesion was greater than two years ago, or if their last lesion was within two years, one gram PO daily is the recommended treatment. Um, treatment is governed by the NCAA guidelines. So this one has specific recommendations and those recommendations are no active lesions for 72 hours. Lesion, um, and they must be on antiviral, antiviral therapy, a minimum of 120 hours. Obviously, antibiotics and steroids are not going to treat the virus, and lesions are not permitted to be covered in order to play. So what are some high-yield um, areas to know for the CAQ? Um, I think that, I mean, obviously, any um, anatomy is fair game. Um, so I don't know that there is a specific high-yield but definitely you are correct. Apophyseal muscle attachments are a big one or muscle attachments in general are a big one. Um, uh, but, uh, but like that, it can be blood supply, nerve supply. All of those things are kind of fair game. Um, you know, obviously it's really hard to review all of your anatomy before the exam, but I mean, any, you know, kind of anything um, can be fair game when it comes to that. Is this timing requirement only for contact sports? Um, so, but outside of wrestling, there are not um, specific guidelines um, for herpes gladiatorium. Now, most sports are gonna follow the same guidelines that they have for wrestling, but um, technically for a sport like, um, you know, that may be non-contact like tennis or something like that, that you may be able to uh, change those requirements based on the sports demands. But the problem is, is you have to remember that any sport, while non-contact, any sport can be contact. So you have to take that risk into account as well. Okay, so question 17. What is the most common cause of weakness in entrapment syndromes? Neuropraxia, de-innervation, exonometis, huh, I can never say that word, uh, neurometis or disuse atrophy. Okay, so um, the majority of people got this right as well. This is neuropraxia. So neuropraxia is a conduction block and it's the most common pathology in entrapment or compression syndromes followed by demyelination. Uh, Deinnervation is complete loss of nerve supply. Um, exonometis is a interruption of the axons of the nerve followed by complete degeneration of the peripheral segment. And that usually occurs in pinching crush injuries or prolonged pressure. And, and neurotometis is an axonal loss from focal peripheral nerve injury where the nerve stroma is damaged in addition to the axon and the myelin.
Okay. Question 18. Which of the following is absolute, an absolute contraindication to collision sports participation? A, a Tor-Pavlov ratio of less than 0 0.8. B, recurrent cervical nord, uh, <laughs> recurrent cervical cord, neuropraxia, or transient quadriplegis, per, per, quadriparesis, sorry. Uh, C, healed or non-displaced stable fracture of C3, C4 at the posterior ring. D, clay shoveler's fracture, or E, healed cervical herniated disc. Okay, so um, most people got this one correct as well. The answer is B, recurrent cervical cord uh, neuropraxia or recurrent quadroparesis. So one episode of neuropraxia with simple resolution and negative workout workup, you're allowed to return to play. However, recurrent episodes is a contraindication. Tor Pavlov ratio is no longer used for clearance and it's been replaced by MRI. Uh, clay shoveler's fracture, and this is an avulsion fracture of the spinous process. It's not an unstable fracture. There's um, there's no contraindication to return to play for that one. In healed stable fractures of the C3, C4, or a healed herniated disc are also not contraindications to return to play. Okay, question 19. In 2008, the U United States uh, Department of Health and Human Services recommended comprehensive guidelines on physical activity for pregnant women. For healthy women, non-exercisers or moderate exercises, what is the minimum recommended time per week of moderate intense aerobic activity during pregnancy? A, 90 minutes, B, 150 minutes, C, 300 minutes, D, 225 minutes, E, only mild intensity exercises advised during pregnancy. Great, Every, uh, almost everybody got this one right. And so it is B, the 150 minutes. So it's the same recommendation as for non-pregnant women. So the recommendation for adults is 30 minutes of vigorous, act, uh, moderate to, uh, activity five times a week. So if you times five by 30, that's 150 minutes a week. Um, light to moderate physical activity during pregnancy has minimal risk and has been shown to benefit uh, women. So some of the benefits, it results in lower heart rate and increased heart rate of var uh, variability and improved cardiac autonomic control. Fasting glucose levels are also decreased, so it can decrease the risk of uh, gestational diabetes. But while exercise helps control blood glucose, there is a slightly higher risk of hypoglycemia. So you do have to take that into account. The other thing is hormonal changes result in increased joint laxity during pregnancy, which could put pregnant athletes at higher risk for joint pain or ligamentous injury. Again, that is kind of a theoretical, we don't really know that for sure, but it's a theoretical thought. Okay, any other, any questions about that one before we move on to the last question? Okay, um, whoops, sorry. Question number 20. What is the major contributor to the increased cardiac output in response to an acute bout of aerobic exercise in well-trained athletes? A, increased heart rate, B, increased stroke volume, C, increased peripheral vascular resistance, or D, increase in systolic blood pressure? Okay, um, so actually the answer here is A, um, increase in heart rate. So 
so I think a lot of people, I thought this one may get people because I think people kind of misread, are going to misread this question. So, um, so they, it's saying that you have well-trained athletes and then what is their major contributor to increase cardiac output in response to well-trained athletes exercising. So yes, as you're training and becoming a well-trained athlete, you do increase your stroke volume. But once you are already a well-trained athlete and you start to exercise, your stroke volume does not actually increase all that much, but your heart rate still does. Even very well-trained athlete, heart rate significantly increases as in response to aerobic activity. And while stroke volume does increase, the effects are modest. Peripheral vascular resistance actually decreases in response to exercise because you're perfusing your musculature and increased systolic blood pressure doesn't directly I'm sorry, doesn't directly contribute to an increase in cardiac output. You do increase your systolic blood pressure, but it doesn't directly attribute to cardiac output. Okay, so, um, so a couple like just closing thoughts for the fellows out there. So, you know, it can kind of be overwhelming because there are, is a lot to cover on the CAQ. So one of the things I often recommend that our fellows do is I recommend that you um, take one of the practice exams especially at this point in time, you're about a, you know, a month or two out from most of you taking your CAQ. So take one of the practice exams, see which questions, or if there are themes that you're commonly missing, like, are you missing a lot of exercise physiology questions? Are you missing a lot of anatomy questions? And then focus your studying more on some of those things that you're missing. And that way you can kind of focus on some of the things that you maybe don't know as much, and then don't spend as much time on the uh, some of the clinical stuff that you already do know. Big thing is also don't get, you know, read the questions very, very carefully because there are little subtle things in there. One or two words, if you misread them, can completely change the question. So just make sure you're reading the question very carefully um, because there will be kind of subtle changes that completely change the question. What do I recommend as a comprehensive uh, studying book? So like I said, um, I recommend the CAQ study guide for questions and I recommend the uh, sports medicine study guide um, and review books, the um, the Finoff Harris book. It's uh, my screen's messing up, but it's in green here. Um, and then there, this is the CAQ study guide. This is the question and answer book. This is the fourth edition. The fifth edition just came out um, and is available on the store. So those are the two, I think those are the two best comprehensive study guides and the most compact um, that are going to be the highest yield. Um, are there practice exams on the AMSS website? I, there are some practice questions on the AMSSM website, but as far as a full exam, I do not think there are. Um, there for the this in the study guide, there are two um, full exam, like two um, full sections on here. So you have um, uh, you have um, kind of one set of test questions, and um, so the way the book is structured, you have. Uh, you know, questions, uh, test one, where it's just like the questions, just like you would see on the exam. Um, and there's two tests. There's a test one and test two. And then the back of the book gives you all the correct answers with all the uh, justifications. Any other questions? So Andy put up the um, testing center website there. And that's um, to, to uh, register to take your test and then the past exams are there. Okay, just um, before we end, does anybody else have any other questions about the CAQ or studying for the CAQ? Okay, guys, well, um, we'll end there tonight. Uh, um, good luck on the last uh, month or two of fellowship and good luck on your CAQ. Um, my email is robinsonj at hss.edu. Um, if you do have any other questions that you think about, um, you're welcome to email me there. And if I don't know the answer, I will try to find it out for you. Thanks for joining.